Hello and welcome to Out of This World. I'm Jamie Hanshaw and back with me is the beautiful, the talented, the brilliant Rachel Wilson. And Hello. <laughs> hope you guys are all ready for some satanic panic, more Super Bowl Grammy uh, high profile rituals. And I am coming to you from Austin, Texas, where it all started for me and driving around, I am having so many memories of when I first moved here because I thought that this was like the place to be for conspiracy theorists. I was living in California and I was just watching YouTube after YouTube and video. I, I saw Alex Jones's uh, Bohemian Grove and I saw Freeman about his uh, Britney Spears mind control video. And I was like, I need to get there where <laughs> <laughs> it's all happening. Where the action and it, is. Yes. And yeah. there used to be this place called Brave New Books. And I was like, if I could just, you know, get to Texas, I could have some people to talk to about this stuff at least. Um, but that got me thinking about the OGs of conspiracy who have been talking about these high profile rituals for uh, at least 15 years or more. Yeah. And I'm thinking Tex Mars. Do you remember him? Oh, yeah. I totally remember him. Huge influence on. So this is um, the personalities that the people who are on YouTube and TikTok right now uh, wouldn't really know about, but they were laid the groundwork for what we're talking about right now. Um, Alex Jones, obviously Freeman and a, another good OG is Isaac Weishaupt. Yep. Uh, yep. So shout out Isaac forever. to all those guys for teaching me, um, all this stuff. And now I can teach it to you. So today is Valentine's day. That makes, uh, Rachel, my Galentine. Oh, that's so, so happy. happy. Will you be my Galentine? I will. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm blushing now. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, so I put a article that I wrote in 2015 on Twitter and I was going through it and I was like, man, this is such good stuff. And it's so pertinent to today, but it was about Katy Perry's Super Bowl performance. Yeah. And also um, the Grammys that happened after that which was very similar to the Grammys that just happened because that Grammy, the 2015 one, was when ACDC opened the whole show singing Highway to Hell and everybody had uh, headbands with light up devil horns on it. Yes, I remember that. So it's the same stuff. It's like when you tune into this stuff, you know it's going to be satanic, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's like a foregone conclusion now. It's just like, oh, which flavor of Satanism will they go with this time? Yeah, and it's not even occulted anymore. It used to be fun no. to decode movies and find little Easter eggs and stuff, but now it's just like overtly Satanic. I know. When the Grammys happened, I was like, well, I don't know what there is to decode here. Um, yeah. <laughs> kind of, there was a little more with the Super Bowl. Um, and actually, I was really surprised to see a lot of people like more mostly normie people of course but like regular people had like a oh thank goodness it wasn't overtly satanic kind of take about it and I was sitting back kind of going oh, I don't know about that like wait yeah. until they see our video because you and I were on the same page right away I think yeah um okay so let's start talking about well okay so the Super Bowl was in Phoenix like it was in 2015 yeah and the phoenix has a lot of esoteric symbolism to, to it you know the freemasons venerate the phoenix it's the their symbol of eternal life right yeah uh phoenix is on the 33rd degree latitude oh i didn't know that and then in 2015 um was when bobby christina brown passed away right before the super bowl yeah and then um, 2012 is when Whitney Houston passed away right before the Grammys. So here you have some looking like sacrifices almost to these high ritual days. And this is a very um, ritualistic season. It's in bulk or February 1st was in 2015. I'm not sure if it was this year, but. Yeah, and like the. the whitney and bobby christina deaths were very bizarre and symbolic in and of themselves anyway and the mm -hmm. way that it happened in like the the bath and the bathtub and how they mirrored each other like that's that was 
one of the more bizarre pairs of celebrity deaths I think ever Mm -hmm. the way that that all went down and then the Grammys in 2012 where Whitney Houston died that was on February 11th just like the Super Bowl this year and that was the year that Nicki Minaj came as the Scarlet Woman to the Grammys with her date, the Pope, the fake Pope. You remember that? Yes, I do. And her song was um, very demonic. And there was like an exorcism going on in that song. So here we, I'm, I'm linking the Super Bowl and the Grammy as a mega ritual. Yeah. Right. Would you agree with that? Yeah, Totally. And they're, I mean, they're just so similar. Like when, when I think back to all of the like iconic satanic or occultic performances from both of those, they're just, they're so, so you would think like the exact same people produce it every time, Mm -hmm. pretty much regardless of who the performer is. Mm -hmm. It just always seems like they're linked. Like this year we had color themes that were the same between both shows and like, um, symbolic, things that were the same and then we had like social justice aspects that were the same there was just like a lot of stuff that it almost feels like the same people put on both shows well madonna was the one who did the super bowl in 2012 and that was pretty heavily um satanic with its babylonian imagery and it's like queen ishtar imagery so she was obviously a representation of a scarlet woman even though the color scheme was like black and gold um yeah, beyonce's performance her super bowl was black and gold too mm-hmm. and then i'm thinking of the weekend a couple of years ago his super bowl was all red yes right and lots of mirrors yeah and when madonna performed after Katy perry or yeah she was doing the black and red thing and her dancers had horns and masks yeah and we see again this year we see some masks Mm -hmm. that reminded me of madonna's not exactly the same but it was similar to her eurovision performance that had like the plague masks Mm -hmm. but this was more of like a biohazard theme but i'm sure we'll get into all of that yeah well, okay, so speaking of Madonna, let's just start here because she's, you know, us- usual suspect number one. Yes. For me. <laughs> she's like and the high priestess of, of literally. things these days. Yeah. Yeah. So she uh, starts all this off with a blasphemous photo shoot for Vanity Fair, European Vanity Fair. And it, it was called the Icon Issue. Of course. Did you see that spread? No, I didn't see that. Okay, so it was her, one of the pictures was her um, as the Last Supper, as the Christ in the Last Supper, but the disciples were all women. Of course. And um, there was one of her in a white dress adorned with dead baby dolls. There was one, uh, well, on the cover of the magazine, she's crying with swords piercing her heart, like um, Sacred Heart and Guadalupe and it's just like an amalgam of Catholicism and looking like satanic imagery uh there was a picture of her in a skull mask with horns next to a man I think she's like leading him by a leash and he's some kind of creature so super disturbing super like even past avant-garde to gross yeah um and really offensive Yeah, I mean, she's been, I mean, I remember, I'm old enough to remember when Like a Prayer, the music video came out, Mm -hmm. and the all of the blasphemous imagery that was in that video, and how it like, just people freaked out about it at the time. And it was, that was like 1990. So it was right around the time of the first, like, satanic panic. And she's, that's been just a recurring theme for her. It's like her old faithful imagery that she goes back to is just like the most blasphemous like black pope anti-catholic type of imagery that she just loves to always go back to i'm remembering in that video is it like burning crosses yes and then that's around the same time that Sinead o'connor did that thing where she cut up the picture of the pope yes right i think that was like the next year Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And uh, I mean, that video had she like frees black Jesus from jail and there's like all kinds of weird stuff. And I went back and watched that not that long ago because my little kids only know Madonna as the scary um, grandma Pam. (laughs) You had texted me a picture and you were like, oh, look, it's grandma Pam. Yeah, Uh, she does look like kids are like, why is this person so popular and famous? And I'm like, well, here's what she was like in the 80s and the 90s. And she was super popular in this mega star, you know, because she came to the Grammys. You sent me a picture of her face at the Grammys. Yeah, it is. And she's got her hair done up like horns, like yep. Rams horns or something. Yes. And it took me a couple of days. I'm like, I know that reminds me of something. And I was like, what is it? And finally I figured it out. I'm like, that's exactly what she reminds yes. me of right now. Yes. And when I got that from you, I was just like, perfect. That's exactly <laughs> what it looks like. And nobody can figure out like, everyone's like, why is she doing this to her face? And I definitely think there's like something else going on other than she's trying to not be old. I really do. And I think it has to do with, she's very much gotten into this transhumanist stuff in Mm -hmm. the last few years, like that Eurovision performance. She says, not everyone is coming to the future, you know? And, Mm -hmm. um, it's, it sounded very much like a, we're going to transcend to the next thing. We're going to transcend humanity, but only, the chosen ones among us are going to do that. Mm -hmm. She's very transhumanist lately. And I think it's got something to do with that. I don't know what it is about this plastic surgery stuff that everybody goes to the same surgeons. They get the same weird procedures. And the latest one is there's a name for it that I know, and I can't think of it right now, but it's basically, yeah, where they take the fat out of your face and make Mm -hmm. you just look like, yeah, that, yeah. They're all doing it. It looks terrible. They all know it looks terrible. Like you said, it transcends uh, avant-garde. It's just gross. It's just like, and people are all asking like, why are they just making themselves ugly? Why are they doing this? Mm -hmm. They don't look youthful. They don't look beautiful. It doesn't look feminine. It looks creepy, like intentionally creepy almost. Even alien. Yes. Right. Which I think we're going to. We're going to find that as a theme too with some of the stuff we're going to talk about. I feel like there's some kind of prosthetic like rubber or Hollywood yeah. going on. Do you remember The Weeknd doing that with his last album? Okay. He had a video out with a whole prosthetic face on that had the same like overly exaggerated cheekbones. It's that same weird face. Mm-hmm. I wonder if that is connected to something that we just haven't put together yet because I see it over and over and over and I'm like, Mm -hmm. there's got to be a they never do this stuff with no reason especially when they're all in lockstep like that doing the same weird thing Mm -hmm. so I wonder what Rachel froze Rachel's frozen oh no oh no oh Oh, there you're back okay good okay um yeah we're talking about Madonna we're talking about facial reconstruction almost um not even looking human anymore uh transhumanism trying to look like animals I think that's the next step yeah it's there's something bizarre with the I don't know if it's implants I don't know if there's prosthetics if it's masks I'm not 100% sure what it is I used to do like a lot of special effects makeup and things like that back when I back in my former life as a as a beauty person um but it's hard to tell because they've gotten so advanced with the implants and everybody's getting chin and cheek implants and they're sucking fat out of certain places and putting it others. And the fillers have gotten really crazy in the last few years. Mm-hmm. They have, like you see the hip hop girls with body fillers where it will make their hips. They almost look like a dang wisdom tooth, you know, with their hips coming out to here and like <laughs> they suck everything out of their waist and then make their hips so wide that it yeah. doesn't. They look like a table with table legs or something. It's very bizarre. And you got to wonder what that's about. And I would not remove the fat in your cheeks because you're going to need that when you're older. That's the first thing to go away. Like when you start really aging, that's when you get really sharp cheekbones and cheekbones and you're going to need that for to look better. 
So they call. Yeah, so it's really weird that you're seeing all these 20 something year old Hollywood girls getting this procedure done. And it's like everybody universally agrees they look worse afterwards and not better. Mm -hmm. So I just feel like there's something else going on there. So she calls her photo shoot daring, which it's not daring <laughs> <laughs> because they're yeah, all doing it. I mean, she they should have called it predictable. Doing it, like you said. Yeah. 25 years there's nothing new in this um she credits her catholic upbringing to all of this stuff and then do you remember her book from 1992 called sex yes okay so she had this book and it features her as a character named dita who fantasizes about a young boy with hardly any pubic hair so this is a book with all like all these erotic stories and one of the stories is about this young pre, I mean, almost prepubescent boy that she's having an affair with as a grown woman. It's like, how is yeah. she not canceled back then? Well, I remember there being a huge stink about it because the, I think the book came out in conjunction with the documentary that she had. Oh, what was it called? It was another thing she did that caused all kinds of fuss. It was what right after around the time of her and Sean Penn having the off again, on again relationship and her talking about him. It was the era of her cone bra look. Mm. And uh, it was like a really racy. It was like the first really, it was almost chronographic. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That mm -hmm. documentary was. And I think the book came out around the same time. But I will tell you, I've been working on a project about this very thing because in all of my study of feminists and how they're usually into occult stuff almost all of them end up in their older years with far younger like borderline boys for boyfriends so mm -hmm. like you know like uh the bolshevik Ale alexandra kolontai was like in her 50s and 60s and she's dating 18 year old guys um margaret sanger dating much younger men a lot of them, a lot of the really prominent feminists, a really common theme, they'll get into their 50s or 60s. So for sure, like postmenopausal, and they pick a very young boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And I'm working on like why I think that they do that. And I think there's definitely a cult symbolism there. I think it's also like a power dynamic where they want to have power and control over somebody much younger and more easily influenced. And I think it's like a big middle finger at the patriarchy kind of a thing. Um, but yeah, there's like a, a running theme of these much older women going after like almost inappropriately younger men on purpose. Yeah. And so this has been kind of an issue that people are talking about right now, these huge age gap relationships. Um, Leonardo DiCaprio, for one, mm -hmm. gets a lot of heat because he you know dumps his girlfriends right when they turn 24 yes <laughs> and he keeps getting older and they stay the same age mm -hmm. um, so it can go both ways you know it's inappropriate either way yeah. I think if if you're going on 15 to <clears throat> years age gap I think that the older person has some kind of you know arrested development or mental there's sexual yeah there's something going on, going on something's going on there but I don't think it's coincidental that these like ultra elite people who we know are into occultic things are very into this mm -hmm. and I think it has to do with like a a certain proclivity that they are rumored to have in a way yeah and they push it as far as they can publicly right so yeah. like Leo's dating some girl it's like 19 or 20 I want to say mm -hmm. so it's like technically not illegal but he's pushing it like as far as you can push it and these women that I'm researching did the same thing and they were always into like weird sex cults and you know bizarre fetishistic things with these very much younger than them men that they had a lot of power and influence over so it's just kind of just their favorite thing which is perversion and inversion of stuff that's good I'm remembering I read this book by Kurt Barker and his uh first sexual encounter was with a much older witch so that could have you know been his grandma he was 12 13 and she was an old woman and that was how the ritual went you know so no that just reminded me i think the prince harry 
autobiography that just came out that everybody's saying has a bunch of lies and nonsense in it. I think he gives what one of his friends alleges is a false story about how he lost his virginity to like a much older woman. Uh huh. Like in a field behind a pub or something. I just saw that. Yeah. And uh, he has a friend who's come out and said like, no, that's not even the story. Like, I don't even know why he made that up, but maybe there's some kind of ritualistic thing going on there. Yeah. I don't know. So her Catholicism is related to the erotic themes in her book. And she says, quote, there's a lot of pain equals pleasure in the Catholic church. And that is also associated with bondage and S and M. So she's talking about people who will like whip themselves or prey on rice or, you know, walk on glass. Um, yeah. I'm thinking, well, what is that one Catholic group that's in Da Vinci Code where the guy's like always flagellating himself? I know what you, I know who you're talking about. And I was just talking to Andy about it, like literally this morning. And now the I Opus can't Day. remember. The word. What's it? What is it? Is it Opus Day or that might be it okay I'm not sure um but yeah there was like that whole period like during the middle ages where catholicism got very like you had the stigmata and different things where it was like the more pain and suffering that you could put yourself through like the more spiritual that was or something it's supposed to be like emulating christ or something suffering yeah, yeah. so in the real world this year, Madonna is accused of child T-R-A-F-F, right? Big yeah. story, not getting a lot of traction, but so in Africa, and they are accusing her of sex exploitation, sex slavery, and adoption reversal. Yep. Um, they yes, can- and... I'm glad you brought that up because it's going to be relevant to our discussion about the Super Bowl halftime show because I found some interesting connections there. But uh, yeah, she's in trouble for going to Malawi and skipping over all of the adoption rules that you're normally supposed to have to go through and like adopting a bunch of Malawian children and then like making them cross dress and do bizarre things and then yeah I think some of them are older now and she's like I don't know if she had relationships with one or two of them there I think there's an older boy that she had taken pictures with like maybe he's 17 or 18 now and there's like rumor about that I don't know if that's true but that's what I have heard and read is that people are alleging that she had like some kind of inappropriate relationship with one of these kids she adopted when he was like 16 or something Mm. Very yeah, she, ha- she has four children from Malawi, and I'm thinking the other two big A-listers that have these um, adopted foreign children, Angelina Jolie. Yep. And Charlize Theron. Oh, I didn't know she had. And Charlize Theron, actually, um, one of her children was, she was raising as non-binary or cross-dressing. That's right. That's right. Remember. Yeah, so, Angelina did that with hers too. Mm-hmm. Hers, hers were non-binary well, or something. Her child with with Brad, Brad Pitt, Pitt was a girl, and she lived her whole childhood as a boy. But she didn't get no surgery. She didn't get no puberty blockers. She didn't get all of that um, irreversible damaging stuff physically. Mm-hmm like other children are encouraged to do and now she's grown up a beautiful girl so she gets to you know go through this phase and come out of it somewhat unscathed but not other children right yeah so madonna shows up to the grammys looking like that damn jigsaw puppet from the saw movies (laughs) and people were not receiving this very well no I think they're sick of it. What do you think? I'm, I really think they're sick of it. And I think it's, it's so aesthetically offensive, you know, to like people who care about aesthetics and aesthetics have objective 
beauty is objective. Like when I went to art school and stuff, it was like you learned about symmetry and color theory and um, perspective and uh, balance and all these other like principles of art and aesthetics. And these people violate them on purpose all the time. Like when we covered the Balenciaga stuff, how they'll do a, a very high fashion show and then make it very disgusting and weird and gross. And there'll be like mud and blood and feces and the grossest things they can come up with. Mm -hmm. And I feel like even the face she's making in the photos, I feel like she knows that she looks terrifying. Like my, I'm not even joking. My 13 year old had nightmares, like oh. Madonna nightmares from, <laughs> and I, I felt bad. I was like, I probably shouldn't have let her watch it. But I thought at 13, I was just like explaining to her, like, these are the weirdos that are out there and this is kind of what they're doing. Yeah. And she just saw like the pictures and stuff. And she had a really terrible nightmare about her. And I think Madonna would know, like she's older, she's been around, she's not stupid. I feel like she would know that like her face is nightmare inducing at this point, well, at least the way she appears in public, whether that's yeah. a prosthetic or not, I don't know, but it that's looks part terrible. of Satanism is aesthetic terrorism. Yeah. And, you know, like you said, beauty is objective and it's linked with truth and love and higher spiritual concepts. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking of, of Jay and Father Vladimir do yeah. podcasts about Renaissance art. Yes. And how that um, raises the consciousness of humanity to a higher standard. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Luke Kendrat did a speech at the Trad Forum two years ago about how beauty will save the world. And he linked all those kinds of concepts and related them to like Orthodox churches and why we have so much symbolism and beauty in our churches. It's not just, you know, like a lot of Protestants will look at it and be like, why all the gold and why all the fancy stuff and why all this? And it's it's for a reason, it's for a purpose. And there's a lot of symbolism and meaning behind those things. And in the same way, I think there's a lot of symbolism and meaning behind these people being purposefully horrific and grotesque. Like even after the Grammy performance, Sam Smith showed up to an award show right after that, looking like a black trash bag full of air. Yeah. With the bubbles. Yeah. Totally absurd. Completely <laughs> absurd. Like these giant, again, this weird shape that a lot of these girls are doing where it makes their hips and thighs look really crazy wide and then you had the big shoulders mm -hmm. it's like a very bizarre like it's meant to be um a crazy exaggeration that's off-putting and gives you like that uncanny valley creep factor to it and they know that I mean do you think they really put that crap on and look in the mirror and be like whoa I look fantastic of course not it looks ridiculous it looks absurd another one would be Doja Cat at the last uh was it the Met Gala with the mm -hmm. red and yeah. she was covered in rhinestones and she's bald and she has no eyebrows and she's very bizarre anyway, but that was, she looked like she didn't have skin on mm -hmm. is what that looked like to me. Mm -hmm. She looked like a skinned human being. It was obviously meant to be creepy, off-putting, disturbing, and gross. Yeah. So it's got to be intentional. I don't believe that these people really think this is beautiful, high art. I don't believe it. No. Um, so the Madonna had a statement when she was hearing the backlash and she said that the people who don't approve of her, she writes off as ageist and misogynist. Of course. So if you don't like ugly things, um, then you're ageist. And if you don't like satanic rituals, you're misogynist. Mm -hmm. So that's just ridiculous right there. And then the celebrities, they're becoming unhinged because people are turning their backs on Hollywood because it's so overtly satanic now. The, yeah. the revelation of the method and all of that is coming out. What's called externalization of the hierarchy. Yeah. And people aren't going along with it like they would like them to. Mm -hmm. And so now they're threatening to go on strike if we don't all take the stabs. So all of these A-listers are getting together and like, we're not going to make any more movies if you're not all on board with this. And I'm like, go ahead. Yeah, your movies have been terrible for the past 10 years. I mean, 
yeah please go away and make room for something better (laughs) and it's like these people and the audacity and politicians are the same way like don't you realize you're nothing without fans and voters yeah you know it's not the top down like you need us to be who you are like you work for us yeah the minute we stop paying attention to you you're irrelevant and everything you have goes away like poof like a like a mirage it like it never existed so these people are just really high on their own supply especially people like madonna i mean think about it she's been famous since 1983 that's 40 years that she's been at the top of the world among the elite just huffing her own farts and high on her own (laughs) supply and just (laughs) you know like I'm sure she doesn't have much uh she doesn't touch grass she doesn't have much grounding in reality these days I don't think Mm -hmm. so I think for her she thinks this stuff is like cool or whatever and doesn't probably realize that normal people like you and I are looking at it going what Mm -hmm. what is this nonsense and especially all of the things, <laughs> everything's getting so serious now with like all of the, the environmental disasters happening, mm-hmm. the economy, the food yep. shortages, the everyone's broke and they're sick of being force fed Satanism. Yeah. Uh, we just want eggs to not be $5 a dozen, you know? Yeah. I mean, come on. Stuff's insane. So... Then you have Sam Smith at the Grammys in his devil horn top hat. Yeah. Right. And I just thought that was so interesting to add that extra element of the top hat because where what does that represent is the uh, worshipful master of the Freemasonic Lodge. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right? Sure does. He's all red. He arrives with his satanic entourage and they're all dressed in red. Mm-hmm. And he's got his top and hat and his cane. And they're all very, like, gender bendy. hmm Yeah. And so is he. His um, partner, Kim, what was that name? Kim Petrus. Never even heard of that person before, but they are a TR. Yes. And... Uh, uh, one of the more convincing ones that you might not overtly know right away mm-hmm. that they are. hmm But, yeah. Uh... They were wearing all red wedding dress. Mm -hmm. So this is something that I saw at the Grammys with Taylor Swift and Beyonce and Kanye. You remember that whole thing when Kanye was like, Beyonce had the best video of all time, embarrassing, embarrassing Taylor Swift or hazing her. Mm -hmm. So when he did that, she was wearing white. And then when she came back out for the apology or whatever, she's wearing all red. So I didn't notice that. This is symbolic of them being wedded to the industry or to Satan. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't catch that when that happened, but now that you mention it, yeah, I'm sure that's got to be what that was. Um, There's a, there's a rock band from Italy called Monoskin who are pretty overtly satanic. Also like all their video imagery and everything is really overtly satanic and they just had a big album release party where they were dressed as like gender bending brides and grooms and had a whole wedding ceremony to release their album so that seems to be another common theme this like mockery of marriage and weddings and like a a satanic union kind of thing Mm -hmm. did you notice that cbs tweeted at sam smith we are ready to worship no yeah that was the network cbs tweet before the show we are ready to worship and i'm not even surprised because cbs is the all seeing eye yeah logo and how much more evidence do you need i don't know we'll keep no, giving it's... it to you i'll keep teaching you ratchets all about this stuff if you want me to <laughs> but <laughs> it's like getting old at this point Jamie's just doing another episode. She's like, yeah, they're all Satanists. They're all doing the same crap they always do. Whatever, whatever, yada, yada. I know. It is, it is getting very predictable at this point. But it it's amazing to me how there are still so many people who are like, oh, you're just being silly. And you're just, you're just, it's just aesthetics. It's just this, it's just that. And they really don't take it seriously at all. 
No, and they're like, oh, it's just tongue in cheek, or they're mocking you back because you right. say that they are this or that, and they're just like playing it up. Right. <clears throat> uh, I found a statement from the actual Church of Satan about the Grammys. Oh, goody. <laughs> and they found the performance meh and all just all right. So it didn't even. It didn't even get the church them. of Satan going. <laughs> no, the oh, um, David so Harris of the Church of Satan said it was nothing particularly special. So I, it, you know what? I would agree. It was very basic bitch Satanism, really. I mean, yeah. like the same usual tropes, the same, same kind of dancing we always see. The song itself, I laughed so hard when Jay was reading the lyrics in his stream to Unholy, because when <laughs> he just reads the lyrics deadpan, it's just so, it's so funny. He's just like, what? <laughs> but... <laughs> Yeah, they, I mean, it was the same kind of stuff that you and I have seen and talked about over and over. So they've got in the background, Kim Petras, the T-R-A-N-Z person in the cage, right? Climbing the cage and everybody's gyrating and thrusting. And there's lots of, um, yeah, just lots of overtly sexual dance moves, lots of smoke, lots of red lighting, red costumes, the devil horns. And then at the end, the, all the dancers like swallow up Sam Smith or whatever. And it's mm -hmm. it was it didn't have the impact that I think they wanted it to. Like a lot of people really panned it as kind of corny and kind of cheesy and kind of like uh, old hat. We've seen it before, like whatever. Mm -hmm. Come up with something new and edgy if you're going to be satanic. That That's the thing. They're not even edgy. And if they were trying to like comment on restrictive religion why is it always just christianity right why aren't they yes exactly how come it's not against a l l a yeah how come it's not why are they not wearing like not again they're not wearing yeah. head scarves or burkas or something and protesting yeah. all of that they never have though they've never been against that even though it's very bizarre because most of the muslim countries don't let these people come and perform there like mm -hmm. a lot of the Southeastern and East African and Middle Eastern Islamic countries will ban these kind of performances there mm -hmm. because it violates, but they don't ever like speak out against that. They never uh, protest that sort of thing. It's only the Christians that they want to dunk on and make fun of. And years ago when I was more, when I wasn't as, I always knew a little bit about this stuff, but I wasn't as into it maybe 15 years ago or something. I'd say like 2008 is when I really started to get into this kind of stuff, like the conspiracy symbolism and things. Prior to that, I always thought it was like they were scared to and Christians were just the easy target because we don't fight back. We tend to, to like turn the other cheek more and tolerate things more. But I don't think that's what it is. I think that the reason they go after Christianity constantly is because we're the actual counter, the the thing that's actually opposite of them. We're the actual truth and that's what they don't like. It's the mm -hmm. actual real good. And I think I've said this to you before, but it, it's almost like the MGTOW guys, they're like, I don't, I'm not thinking about women ever again. I'm going my own way. But then they're obsessed with women and what they're doing yeah. so satanism is like that like i reject god and i'm going my own way and all yeah. they do is like be dedicated to blaspheming god like if you yeah. really just wanted to go your own way you wouldn't even think you about would just it. ignore it yeah, yeah. You, you really would just go do what you wanted to do do what yeah. thou wilt and mind your own business but no they're like obsessive about <clears throat> trying to offend Christians, trying to blaspheme Christianity. Yeah, they're just super obsessed with it. So mm -hmm. did you see Sam Smith's music video called I'm Not Here to Make Friends? No. Oh. Right is on. that the one where, wait, is that the one where he's, I mean, he's looking chunky. This is another thing. So people keep going back and looking at older pictures of him and he was pretty handsome. Mm -hmm. And when he first came out, like my oldest daughter, who's now about to be 22, really liked his singing. 
I wasn't a fan, but that's because it's not my kind of music. Well, he has a but beautiful she, voice. Yeah, he's got he a beautiful just voice. Had a great career with his beautiful voice. But... Yeah, but no, that's not what happened. But when he was young, he was like this handsome, might be gay guy, right? Mm-hmm. And now in the last like year or two, he's gained a ton of weight. He's doing these crazy weird costumes and cross-dressing and being like, it's kind of like what we've talked about a lot with the Disney girls, where they start off with like this pop princess, like childish, cute in image. And then inevitably the minute they turn 18, they become video vixens. They have to be sexy and everything's about their sexuality. It's almost like they did the same thing with him, but like the guy version where it's like, well, now I, now I'm non-binary and I'm they, them, and I'm cross-dressing and I gained a bunch of weight. What do you think about that? And it's just Mm -hmm. like meant to be offensive and weird. And this idea of like, no, we're like Lizzo, right? No, it's beautiful that I'm morbidly obese and look really unhealthy. And like, there's something wrong. And like, I have substance abuse issues, perhaps like it's cool. And who are you to say that I'm not beautiful at any size and it wasn't he wearing like um a white outfit in that video is that the one you're talking about where he's got like pearl necklace and like shiny white outfit on or is that something else that I saw him in uh he had a lot of different outfits but just the thing that stuck out to me is the dancers had like assless chaps that were shaped in a heart and there's a scene where they're all you know those like fountains where the little boy's peeing there's a scene where there's streams coming like he's mm-hmm. bathing in this and like even putting it in his mouth and gargling it it's they're so obsessed really with that stuff it's like everything's about butt stuff and everything's about like the grossest like just the grossest sexual things that they can come up with well that's all crowley stuff so yes. you know that's uh ingesting all the body fluids and everything you have to do the grossest thing imaginable to get to the other side and transcend good and evil. Yeah. Right? That's the checkerboard floor. That's the Masonic, you know, whatever. Yeah. And there's, there was a lot of that in like the ancient Hindu practice, like the, before it was really Westernized, there was um, like, this is, I've had to study this oddly because of my new book that I'm doing about Bolsheviks, because there were some of them that were really into this Himalayan Uh, or like Buddhist, I think it is, not Hindu, Buddhist mysticism, like the older kind, not the transcendental uh, happy Buddha guy, but like the the Himalayan ones that thought that they could transcend. Yeah, they would do crazy stuff like with corpses and like, it was the same idea of like, you have to transgress everything to overcome it like you have to do the most gross and like sacrilegious and taboo things that you can possibly think of Mm -hmm. and they had levels to it and it was the same thing it was like level one was like a golden shower thing and then you just get grosser and grosser as you go up yeah yeah so here's a recent picture i think this was four days ago and people are not loving this look I don't want to put it too close, but he looks like he a looks ham. Like, he looks like I was just gonna say he looks you know like a Christmas ham, ham all wrapped up. <laughs> yeah. So, and this is part of the humiliation that these people have to go through to get to where they're going. Yeah. Um. What else? So they did this magic circle. He did the this hand sign, um, which is not. I mean, it could be six six six, but in the the Tibetan traditions and stuff. This is more about you're in the womb or the club. Oh. Or, you know, you're in it, you're in it now. Um Kim Petras, one of the lyrics in the song was about wanting a Balenciaga daddy. Yep. So there's some references to good old Balenciaga. Yep. And it was all brought to you by guess. Pfizer. Yeah. It, it, yes. it's like surreal at this point like it here's is. satanism brought to you by pfizer right oh and then another performance of the grammys was jay-z at the last supper did you catch that one? Oh yeah yeah that was a while ago wasn't it that was a older one if i remember was it i think it was this one 
Oh, it was this one? Yeah, so he, I didn't watch all of the Grammys this year. I only saw the Sam Smith one. They're at the table. And I saw a little bit of the opening, like red carpet stuff. Um, gigantic spread. And when people are not being able to afford all the food that they need, it's kind of a, a taunt or you yeah. know, a gaslight, a slap in the face that these people are sitting back eating like kings. And he's calling himself uh, God and Hova and I am him. And oh, you mentioned that these people aren't allowed to perform in the Middle East. But however, Beyonce just did the first concert that she's done in a long time in Dubai. But it was a secret concert and they are just having like little leaked videos here and there so I can't really analyze it that well but it's looking creepy it's looking Dubai Dubai is getting interesting because it's becoming like this globalist capital where all of the elite go and they've got the Burj Khalifa and it's like there's some crazy elite stuff going on in Dubai I feel like Mm -hmm. lately I feel like that's going to be their new place they all like to go and do whatever it is that they do so that doesn't surprise me that she would do a secret performance there just like everything else in evil it's all a facade because that big khalifa doesn't even have a sewage system so every day a whole cavalcade of poop trucks have to go in and take the poop out and take it somewhere else because the place is not even built correctly Kind of like how China has all the fake cities. Yeah. yeah. So it's just a facade of luxury. And in reality, it's really gross. Um, so I guess that's all I had about the Grammys for right now. But I just kind of wanted to make this point. And you said, yeah, the song was called Unholy. Mm-hmm. Um, and most of these pop love songs are about Lucifer. Yeah. They're not about a lover. They are owed to Satan. And Satan is like the ultimate abusive boyfriend it, to me, right? Because yeah. he, offer, he offers you all these things and all you get is abused. Yeah. He's like the narcissist who just uses you, right? Yeah. And like the lyrics to that song, again, are like a an overt mockery of the family of motherhood of fatherhood um and it's like this attitude and you hear this all the time with like the progressive left anti-christian crowd that i debate all the time they all assert that you all all you christians you say you care about family and you say that marriage is sacred but we all know that secretly you're into the same creepy twisted stuff we are. We all, oh, some of the most perverted people I've ever met are Christians or some of the most twisted people I've ever met are Christians. They love to perpetuate this idea that the the more you seem like you're living on the straight and narrow path, that secretly you're doing the worst stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And that, well, we're just up front with all the stuff that we're doing, right? Yeah. And the song is basically about like a a husband and father who is off doing Lord knows what at like a bathhouse strip club type of a place. And they don't specify, but I'm guessing that since Kim Petras is trans, that they're making this connection that like, oh, men really are into trans women. They really don't want biological women anymore because that's boring. That's boring. Right. And so they're secretly what they really want is trans women and I hear this a lot like unfortunately my husband and I end up talking to a lot of like the twitch left progressives and these people are like many times overtly satanic and very very anti-christian and will do anything to like get a rise out of christians so this is like a favorite it's just a favorite theme of theirs to be like, oh yeah, the nice husband and father is secretly, you know, watching tranny P-O-R-N stuff. They love it when like a Republican politician will get caught in a scandal, like a Yeah, or like an evangelical preacher. Yeah. That's their favorite. And then they go, see, you're all like that. That's what you're all doing. We are just honest enough to be out in the open about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's basically what that song's about. And 
why the performance was the way it was and all that stuff. It's just like a big middle finger to anybody who's trying to actually, you know, live the way that we probably live and, and go to church and worship and have family and community and try to, um, avoid the passions and conquer our passions. It's like a big middle finger because they're, they have the opposite spiritual belief. They think you're supposed to embrace all that stuff and just dive in and lean into it Mm -hmm. and do like the, the, it's a Crowleyan thing, right? Do the most creepy, most debased, demeaning stuff to gain like earthly power and whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Let's talk about Rihanna for a second. Yes, um, let's, because I, I have some really fun, I have some fun tidbits about her. <laughs> I know you have good stuff. You always do. No, now she's the richest female pop star. Yep. Richest in the world. $1.7 billion net worth as of 2021. Okay. So she's rich for her Fenty clothing and makeup line. And I found something interesting she works with a fashion designer named Gio Forbici, I think is how you say his name. And his Instagram is just as gross as your Balenciaga people. Mm-hmm. Um, one image has a child with an open mouth and the hashtag is choke. Nice. His girlfriend, Bianca, posted a selfie on instagram with a caption my p-e-d-o babe like i don't know how this stuff is allowed on instagram (laughs) yeah we we talk about c-o-v-i-d and we get banned from things but these people can put that stuff and they don't get yeeted off of inner off the internet that's crazy yeah so another image i found was a sheep over candles and the caption was working on a sheep sacrifice Nice. Another image, two teddy bears tied to a post. Uh, hashtag river ritual. These people love their teddy bear imagery. Yeah. And uh, we've been over why that is, you know. Because of uh, monarch mind control. Mm-hmm. Right? The child is just a dolly that you can do whatever. It has no soul or brain. It's just a stuff. Right. Animal. Right. Another image by Bianca, blood all over the floor, and the caption is, a child don't know what bad is. Another image from Bianca uh, was someone sitting in a Catholic church where they're taking a picture of the altar kids, and there's someone holding an iPad with the image of a child with blood on their face. And the caption was, last Xmas, I killed them all. Okay, that's like, this is a new level even for these people, like I remember a lot of the different Instagrams that some of these people have had that a lot of them are gone now that had this type of stuff with like very young or child models with like bruises on their eye or like looking very thin and fragile and like possibly starved or possibly tied up or like there's been some bad stuff, but like that's kind of, that's kind of a new level to be that overt about it. I got more. Um, one of Geo's Instagram image was the Virgin Mary and a goat's head pentagram. And the caption was good together. Um, one of Beyonce, or Bianca's images was body bags and an ax on the floor. You know, the Sam Smith black trash bag outfit mm-hmm. could be perceived of as a body bag. That's true. I had that pulled up, but it went away um here's bianca's image a child on a bike and her sitting in the car eating a hamburger and a soda the caption was sending nudes and eating shit and killing kids hashtag me so edgy she's such an edge lord uh another image from bianca two men holding a very young child shirtless one is undoing his belt. The caption is nothing more beautiful than this. It's really weird because I didn't know this stuff. Like, I didn't know that you had this information and it directly reflects some of the information that I'm going to show you that you don't know I have 
So this is going to be very interesting. This okay. is going to be some synchronicity here because that's crazy. Okay. So I have one more thought and then you tell me what you found and I'll Okay. So Rihanna has kids with ASAP Rocky who works with Rick Owens, the fashion designer and his old hag witchy wife. Look up. I can't remember her name, but she looks like a high priestess of Satan, right? She looks like Baphomet himself. And in ASAP Rocky's video, what's up? He's doing a ritual in a pentagram. I mean, it looks legit. It's for a video, but could be real. That's nuts. So what did you find? Okay, so uh, first I thought it was interesting that Rihanna was born in St. Michael mm-hmm. in Barbados. Mm-hmm. Just interesting. But really what I dug into was her philanthropic work, because if you guys follow any of the stuff that any of us do, philanthrop- phil- philanthropy and these philanthropic foundations are usually basically kind of a front for things that you would not consider charitable at all and possibly for like money laundering and things of that nature. Again, Mm -hmm. not accusing anybody. I'm just saying it can look that way sometimes, right? So she has a foundation she founded in 2012 called the Clara Lionel Foundation. It's named after her maternal grandparents. Um, And they, they do a bunch of things, but one of their primary things that they do, I'm sure you'll all be totally shocked and surprised is that they they partner with Planned Parenthood and Engineers Without Borders to make abortion clinics more resistant to climate change. Like, can you think of a more, (laughs) yeah. So they, you know, this narrative that hurricanes and earthquakes and natural disasters are all now a result of climate change. And they said, you know, in Haiti and East Africa and Malawi, mm. where the foundation does all its work, mm-hmm. uh, we noticed that we kept having, you know, all these natural disasters and that it would shut down the abortion clinics. So we we dumped millions of dollars into making them more resistant to climate disasters and bad weather and things like that. Because, you know, when a hurricane comes, the primary concern is, are people able to access abortion services? Yes. So That's this is the number one human right that we're all right. About. Not well, for, her, for her foundation, it is. So that's like one of their primary things they dump money into is making these abobo clinics um, more natural disaster or climate resilient is what they call it, right? Mm -hmm. So I looked into what they do and where they do it. And so one of the primary places is Malawi, which you said at the beginning is where Madonna seems to procure her children, Mm -hmm. interestingly. And so Rihanna went there and she met with government officials in 2017. And in trying to determine how they could help, they got children bikes. And you just said that the creeper lady on Instagram had a picture of children on bikes. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, So they're giving kids bikes for some reason. I don't know how this helps poor children in Malawi. I guess they're saying, oh, they can get to school or something. But I'm like, okay. Um, It just doesn't, like poor kids in Malawi probably need other things besides bikes. I'm just guessing, but, but whatever. Okay. That for some reason they picked bikes so that kids can get to school. And then also the other place they go is Haiti. You guys probably know a little bit about Haiti and the Clinton Foundation and a lot of kids disappearing and stuff like that. And they are doing the same kind of things. And it's always, right, it's always a philanthropic effort to help kids. And you would think with every billionaire on planet Earth having a, a philanthropy foundation that helps kids in these same places, why are they still dirt poor? If they're giving, you know, $47 million a year, Every single person in Malawi could have like a very high standard of living if they just like gave them the money, but that's not what they do. It's like, oh, we're going to um, make schools and we're going to have orphanages and we're going to have adoption agencies and we're going to have a bobo clinics and all these things that lend themselves to TRAFF type of things, right? Yeah. Yeah not saying I have evidence of that. I'm just saying that it's a, it's another pattern that we see all the time in the same places with the same people. 
And uh, when we look into the clinic and who runs it and who funds it, we can always find out what's really going on. So uh, the director of Rihanna's, so Rihanna's the founder of mm -hmm. the CLF, the Clara Lionel Foundation, the director and the board president, her name is Tamara Larson. And she was the former managing director of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund Agility, uh, which is their like investment office. So she ran like a huge Rockefeller Brothers conglomerate, their whole investment side of things before working for Rihanna and her organization. Um, aside from that, she has also served as the co-chair of investment committees for the David Rockefeller Fund mm -hmm. um, and some other like similar organizations that are all like Rockefeller connected. So the, the person running Rihanna's foundation is massively in bed with Rockefellers. Um, the vice president of Rihanna's foundation Jessie Shooty Ainey. She has 25 years of experience working in the UN system for the United Nations. Or she is, yeah, she's the current chief equity, gender, and cultural diversity person at the World Health Organization, which is very pertinent because Rihanna's foundation has given, as of December 2021, $47 million to COVID relief and racial justice issues. So her vice president of her organization is working with the UN and the World Health Organization. The same people that were like, masks don't work. Masks are necessary. Okay, no, they don't work again. All these things, right? Mm -hmm. um, just some some crazy stuff that you guys probably know about with the UN and the World Health Organization. And she was also their former regional office director for the Americas and the Caribbean. Um, she's also had roles at UN AIDS, like the UN AIDS Foundation, which we're going to get into where that connects in a second. Uh, prior to that, she ran the World Health Organization Caribbean AIDS stuff and the International Planned Parenthood Federation in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So everyone in her organization is UN, WHO, Rockefeller, Planned Parenthood International, connected people before even coming to the organization, which I just feel like tells you exactly what they were trying to do when they put this together. One of the board members, Cheryl Alston, also came from the Tides Foundation. If you guys have ever done any digging into the Tides Foundation, they are basically a giant umbrella group that gives dark money to every kind of progressive globalist cause you could think of um, included. And this woman um, coming from the Tides Foundation, she worked with the Carnegie Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Soros Open Society and the Rockefeller Foundation. So basically just like a who's who of all of the globalist billionaire villains right <laughs> this is just like britney's foundation it is it's exactly like that so basically they prop up these giant pop stars they put them at the top of the hierarchy and then they connect all of the usual suspects the usual giant globalist entities that have billions and billions of dollars and are doing crazy things you know all of these giant organizations billions of dollars and there's dozens of them. You can't even ever, like, I could study them until I die and never get through all of them. Mm -hmm. And they're all in the same places. Why is Haiti still a total dump? Why is Malawi still desperately poor? These are small areas. Yeah. And with all of these giant organizations pumping in millions and millions of dollars every year, tens of millions, billions of dollars every year, and they're still desperately poor and they're still third world and something's going on if you ask me um we and um jay's godfather his mother goes to ethiopia all the time on charitable trips and what she has to do is make sure that she gets the resources directly to the people because charities and the governments are so corrupt that they'll just skim off everything right off the top. And then once it trickles down, it's nothing. Yeah, basically, basically that's what happens. It's kind of like a giant racket and then it lends itself to all kinds of exploitation 
And like we were talking about these like wealthy, famous people going in and adopting all these kids is a little bit weird. Was there um, a scandal about UN troops are wording people? Oh yeah, always. Right? All the time, pretty much everywhere they go. The, like the UN blue helmets, there's pretty much always a scandal they're trying to cover up wherever they send those people. Mm-hmm. Um, and then this is another common theme of Rihanna's foundation. They say that they are rebuilding the Caribbean and East Africa after hurricanes. And this is another thing I find all the time that the organizations who claim to be going in and rebuilding places after a disaster are usually up to shenanigans. Um, (laughs) Like you saw that with a lot of the hurricanes, even here in Jamaica or different places where it's like, they don't even get water, right? There's people are giving millions, like Americans are donating tons and tons of money and, and the people can't even get dang bottles of water because they're like stacked in pallets at the airport type of a thing, you know? Do you remember that Flint, Michigan water crisis and all the celebrities were like donating yeah. bottled water in yeah. millions of dollars? And it's like, if they had put all of that resource into just fixing the problem, they would have had water instead of bottled water. And that's a whole another ball of wax, like how Nestle owns all of the water and it's all contaminated and it's not a human right anymore. It should be something that we have to pay for. And anyways, yeah. Yeah. And I live in Michigan and it's still like that. It's still, Flint is still a mess. There's still places where you, they don't have like the pipes and everything. They still don't have water. It's insane. And it's how many years later? Yeah. So yeah, they, you just hear about millions and millions of dollars and all these celebrities pumping in all this stuff and nothing changes. So you kind of have to ask yourself what you think is really going on there. So when I saw that one of the main focuses was Malawi and Haiti, it's like, okay, we know what Madonna has been doing in Malawi. We know what the Clinton Foundation has been doing in Haiti. Why did they once again pick these two locations? And of course, what's their focus? Kids. Their focus is kids. Mm -hmm. Education for kids, services for kids, but also Planned Parenthood clinics. Did Oprah get in a scandal about her girl schools or am I probably I probably know. I should go back and look because I vaguely remember something in the back of my brain about that about her yeah. also setting up all these girl it's a very popular thing the Bill Gates Foundation and all these different places uh Rockefellers all of them have girl schools mm-hmm. all their white papers are filled with like we're gonna put 50 million dollars into education for girls like African girls should be like ruling the world by now with the (laughs) amount of focus and money and celebrities that are being dumped in. And I don't think that's happening. Um, So here's where some dots start to connect from what you found and what I found. So in, what was this? 2015, I think. No, it was a little after that. Yeah, it was 2017. Uh, Rihanna did her first fashion collab. This was right before she actually founded Fenty Beauty Mm -hmm. from the fashion house Fenty, which in her logo, the N is backwards. Mm. I'm not totally sure what that means, but they love to slip in some backwards stuff every now and again. So if you, if you ever find out why there's a backwards N in there, I'd like to know, wasn't (laughs) able to find anything, but I do know about the backwards E, why they do that a lot, because in Gematria, like E is the fifth letter and that's five points on the pentagram. And if you reverse it, then you are inverting the pentagram. Okay. That's all I know. So I don't know what N is in represents or whatever, but I have to ask one of the Gematria guys and see if they know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so she she created a t-shirt that was for charity that said, We should all be feminists. Mm. Your favorite. I'm sure you guys know how I Rachel feel about agrees that. with that. Yeah, it's my favorite. Um, Yeah, it was just a t-shirt. It was in like a Dior fashion show. And it was a collaboration between Rihanna, Donna Karen, the fashion designer, and the Parsons School of Design. Now, the Parsons School of Design is very interesting. So they had like the artists or designers who helped make this t-shirt. Like how complicated could it possibly be to make a t-shirt that just says we should all be feminists? I don't know why you need like design professionals for that. But they went with the Parsons School of Design. The Parsons School of Design is part of the new school in New York. 
And the reason I know about this is because one of the people I reference in my book, Occult Feminism, is Kristen, Kirsten Soleil. She's a third generation witch who is a professor and teacher at the New School. The New School is like this ultra left progressive school that was founded in 1919. Um, and it's just gotten like more wild ever since then with the times. And in 2015, the new school rebranded. It got like new branding done. And the the Parsons School of Design, which is part of the new school, did the rebranding in a collaboration with a design company called Pentagram. Okay. So, and this is like a very progressive art firm that does design for like the usual things that you would guess that a, does a firm called Pentagram would do. It's like very avant-garde, very bizarre, weird stuff. Um, and they also did a collaboration with the UN on like a climate change project, putting together like all of their design and emblems and like visuals for their climate change project. And so they're the ones that helped Rihanna with the We Should All Be Feminist t-shirt. Mm -hmm. And the new school, surprise, surprise, is Rockefeller funded. Again, like Usual since its suspect, inception. All the time. All the time. Every single yeah. time, man. So after that, that was a big success. And of course, again, the proceeds from this were supposed to go to help like children in Haiti or something. And it probably didn't. <laughs> um, but Fenty, the fashion house. So she's got her makeup line, which I remember that launching because I was still in the industry um, working when that came out. And there was a ton of hype around the products. I didn't think they were that good. And it was like a, a carnal sin to not love Fenty Beauty because it was the first like really inclusive like brand that had like uh for dark skinned women and all this stuff but there is the stuff was nuts it wasn't it was really expensive it was not that good mm -hmm. in my opinion at the time oh, all that makeup is full of chemicals and oh it's not only that but it's like okay so she came out like one of her first items she launched was a gold highlighter like a yellow gold crazy glittery highlighter and i'm like the only people who are going to wear this are drag queens. Like I can't wear, use this in weddings. I can't use this for regular photo shoots. It's like, mm -hmm. it was some really crazy stuff. And even in her Super Bowl performance, they do a little nod to Fenty Beauty where she takes the little compact and powders her nose kind of towards the end there. Mm -hmm. um, Cause she's made the most money off of her makeup and lingerie brands of everything she's done. But yeah. she established the Fenty Fashion House as a subsidiary, <laughs> subsidiary, of Louis Vuitton. Louis Vuitton is owned by a giant conglomerate. And this is something that's really common in the fashion and beauty industries. You guys might know of a brand or a label, but they're almost all owned by like the same two or three brands. And Moet Hennessy Louis Vuitton is like the parent company of Fenty Beauty. And if you get into that, it's just like, we could do five hours on the people that are in, it's kind of like Balenciaga where it's like every single person involved in that, <clears throat> all the creative directors, all the artistic directors are like overt Satanists. They are the kind of people who want to like abolish age of consent laws and things like that, right? It's the same, same thing you find in the fashion industry over and over it's a bunch of like, you know, fake and gray dudes who are into creepy stuff and want to lower the age of consent, if you know what I'm saying. Um, and that kind of like when you were talking about the girlfriend, who was, who was the girlfriend who had the creepy Instagram? Who was her boyfriend? ASAP Rocky's person he was working oh, with? Rick Owen? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's kind of like that where um, then Rihanna's involved with these people and then she does the Mac Viva Glam, which Mac is another huge makeup brand that is under the Estee Lauder umbrella, which I could do a whole show on Estee Lauder too, because mm -hmm. there's some crazy stuff there. And it's an HIV AIDS thing. All of these entities we just talked about, almost all of them have an HIV AIDS charity of some kind. They're always in Africa. Same thing again. And so when, when Rihanna did the Mac Viva Glam campaign, 
that's a UN partnership. So mm-hmm. Mac partners with the UN for their HIV AIDS global initiative. She um, also has a partnership under her foundation with the Global Partnership for Education. The Global Partnership for Education is also tied into the UN, like very heavily, UNESCO and everything, all their funding for the Global Partnership for Education, where Rihanna has these schools in these places like Haiti and Malawi. Mm -hmm. um, There's been a lot of people who have criticized it because all of her funding goes through the Global Partnership for Education first, then it goes through the World Bank or UNICEF, and then like trickles down. And there have been people who have said by the time it filters through all these, like the World Bank, the people it's supposed to help don't really get the money, but nothing's been done about it. So Rihanna's also been a global ambassador for the Global Partnership for Education before they were involved with her foundation. So basically all Rihanna is as the richest pop star on the planet is she is basically a globalist shill for all the usual suspects, the Rockefeller Foundation, George Soros, Open Society, the UN, WHO, UNESCO, all these giant globalist conglomerates that say they're philanthropic and say they're pumping billions of dollars into fixing the world's problems, yet practically nothing has changed for these places in my entire lifetime. Yeah. So, and so when you look, is when you look into her organization and what it actually does, and where they do it, and how they get the money, and where the money is filtered through, she's just kind of a face. She's just kind of a puppet face, and it's all the same globalist entities that always run everything, just using her face and her image to pump all this money into their giant tentacle monster to do Lord knows what. Yeah. Basically, what it is. So. You brought up the UN mm-hmm. and this is all wrapped up in that. And a lot of people don't know the UN used to be called Lucifer Trust or Lucius Trust. Yeah. Right. It was a um, arm of theosophy. Yep. Alice Bailey. Whose goal was to abolish Christianity on earth. Mm-hmm. And in my article that I put on Twitter today from 2015, it's called 2015 Super Bowl Ritual Spectacular on freemantv.com. Um, I'm just going to read this little excerpt from it because it kind of ties this like UN occult stuff together. So there was a Pepsi commercial in the halftime show in 2015 called Halftime Touches Down. And this wraps up the aliens too i mean we've all been watching the alien yes. saga yeah, we gotta get into the actual symbolism in her performance next so i'm glad that yeah. you're going there with this so um pepsi commercial called halftime touches down begins with a lone pepsi machine standing in the wilderness which is abducted by a blue beam and then it's like the stanley kubrick movie 2001 space odyssey which is an arthur c clark who is a creeper creeper science fiction guy um the black monolith so the pepsi machine is like the black monolith in this commercial right and this is supposed to represent mankind's next leap in evolution and uh the black monolith and i talk about this in my live talk called all seeing ai it um is a technologically focused forced evolution that goes against creation right and it's very important to the temple of set so Alistair Crowley's book, The Vision in the Voice, there's a passage about the black cube and it says, pass on therefore, O thou prophet of the gods unto the cubical altar of the universe. There shalt thou receive every tribe and kingdom and nation into the mighty order that reaches from the frontier fortress that guard the uttermost abyss unto my throne. So he's talking about a world government, a world religion, United mm-hmm. Nations, right? Yeah. So at the UN building in New York City, there's this thing called the meditation room. Yes. There's this, um, it's a wedge-shaped room with an eerie stone black altar. And this is where every kingdom and nation are located. And in the early fifth, I have a little picture. I don't know if it'll, here's the, what the UN worships. Yep. And if you go to, I have in my book also the actual website page you can go to where they still have that. 
they still have a picture of it. Uh -huh. And like during COVID, they would have updates on it, like saying, oh, we can't do our usual um, worldwide transcendental meditation and purpose because of the pandemic. So we're going to do it virtually online and like all this. So they still completely do this. And this is like a hundred years old. So in the early 1950s, this, um, I think he's a Swedish guy, Dag Hammarskjöld, who's the second se secretary general of the UN. He spearheaded a campaign supported by the multi-faith Friends of the UN Meditation Room. So this is one world religion right here. Yes. Yep. Um, group to revamp the room. He personally planned and supervised every detail and it reopened 1957. He said he had a very strong feeling about the spiritual world and he felt that it should be the center of the United Nations. Uh, his quote is, the stone in the middle of the room has more to tell us. We may see it as an altar empty, not because there is no God, not because it is an altar to an unknown God, but because it is dedicated to the God whom man worshiped under many names and in many forms. So this thing is made of, it's six and a half ton block of iron ore. Mm -hmm. Uh, polished on the top and illumined from above with a single spotlight. This was a gift of the King of Sweden and the Swedish mining company and the only symbol in the room. He described it as a meeting of the light of the sky and the earth. It is the altar to the God of all, which is Pan. Mm -hmm. Alistair Crowley and the Hidden God. There's a whole book that I got a whole bunch of good stuff out of that. I mean, juicy tidbits of what's going on. Not good, but um he said we want this massive altar to give the impression of something more than temporary so the god of all is pan uh the room itself is in the shape of a trapezoid mm -hmm. which is very important to satanists because it's called a frustrum because it's the pyramid with no capstone right um and even in the church of satan there's an order inside it called the order of the trapezoid what else he talks about obtuse angles are magically harmful to people unaware and here is a picture from a magazine called starfire that was connected to the, these groups and the un so this is all connected um to katie perry and the um super bowl of 2015 so if you want more of that oh here's Good old Madonna at the Grammys. You see that? In nice. Yeah, I see all the devil horns and yeah. Um, so yeah, go check that out if you guys are more interested in the black cube and more Illuminati symbolism like that. Yes, and in my book, I do talk about the black cube and some of the organizations that are tied to this because it sounds weird, but veganism and climate change all tie into this for these people like the there are groups that are explicitly like vegan activist groups climate change activist groups that are spiritual in nature who fund and support the united nations like spiritualist group that that's their little worship temple inside the un headquarters very bizarre i feel like every american should know this and almost none of them do which is why i included it in my book as well because it's just like why this is insane it's insane that people don't know that but yes so rihanna's stuff is all connected to the un which is all connected to this one world government new age transhumanist nonsense and the occult mm -hmm. and when jamie and i we watched the rihanna's halftime performance and it was a little frustrating afterwards to see people be like oh my gosh, she's pregnant and she stayed all covered up and there was nothing like really that bad. It was just like a nice, clean, good performance. It was so nice to see. That's not what I saw at all. Uh, did she not turn her um, backside to the camera and do a whole move? Did you see that? Oh yeah. Okay. So let's kind of go over it. So when it opened, this is the first thing I noticed. They're up on these like floating platforms mm -hmm. that are suspended and they're coming down like this. First thing I thought of was, okay, we've had these unidentified objects in the sky getting shot down. One of them near my house over here in the Great Lakes area. 
um and airspace over lake michigan being closed and then they shoot this thing down over um lake huron and then there was another one and then another one. there's been three or four so far and people are speculating as to what this is and they're it's almost like an alien landing right mm-hmm. so they're in these outfits and sure i guess they weren't g-strings but rihanna's in red like a scarlet woman exactly her outfit is like plasticky it's not even like leather or pleather it's almost like plastic sheeting is what Mm -hmm. it looked like kind of similar to the sam smith balloon outfit trash bag outfit but like this plasticky red outfit and you can see her pregnant belly but it's she's mostly covered and then all of her dancers are in what looked to me and jamie seemed to agree looked like white biohazard like hazmat suits yeah puffy outfits um and they've got like a plastic mask over it with like goggles under it Mm -hmm. which reminiscent of pandemic and reminiscent of uh biohazard right yeah and and also And so we're thinking biohazard and this train had just crashed in Ohio with this toxic chemical dump that the media was like covering, not covering very suspiciously. And now there's been a second crash. Was the second crash in Arizona? There was one one in Houston. Houston. One in Arizona, one in South Carolina, and one in Ohio. Okay. So they're in hazmat outfit outfits and there's these toxic train crashes happening all over the country um yeah. but also jamie made a really astute observation that rihanna's in red and all her dancers are in white kind of like blood cells and i was like "Ooh, i hadn't thought of that but yes perhaps because remember the grammy performance was sponsored by pfizer i don't know who sponsored the halftime show do you no i don't remember who the sponsors were Mm-mm. We, but, were, we were filming in a studio so I was kind of like watching over someone's shoulder as they were on their little iPad like a stranger I'm like okay what's going on yeah but we were um doing some filming they also reminded me of the um do you remember that show squid games yes the and kind of, the yeah. people that worked in the squid game that would remove all the dead bodies and in their suits that's what they look like a little bit to me and you're frozen again. So we're talking about Rihanna's the Scarlet Woman. She's surrounded. Oh, you're back. Yeah. Okay. She's surrounded by her white blood cell dancers or Squid Game has <laughs> not weird. I don't even know. Well, it's weird because they were, it did look like a biohazard suit because it had a hood. It had the plastic face masky thing that they always Mm -hmm. wear and then it had goggles under it so you couldn't really see the people's faces and you couldn't see their bodies too much they appeared to me to all be male yeah who knows I couldn't like confirm that but they looked like they were all men to me and of course all people of color because we have to throw that in there but I was looking at it going okay she's pregnant she's the scarlet woman and she's surrounded by a bunch of men and all the choreography there was a lot of dancing, but there was a lot of thrusting. <laughs> there was a lot oh, of her yeah. bending over and them like thrusting at her type of a thing. What about what sperms? Came... Yeah, could be. Sperms? Could be. Because uh, what came to my mind when I saw that, when I saw this pregnant woman being surrounded by men who are thrusting at her and she's bending over at them, was in my book, I also talk about how... Uh, in the pagan ancient world, they would have full moon orgies where everybody would, uh, it would be a bunch of men and one lady and everybody would get involved for the express purpose of making sure nobody could determine who the dad was Mm -hmm. so that the lineage could only be established through the woman. And this was a goddess worship ritual in ancient times to, to empower the woman and for the line to only be established through her and for nobody to know the paternity of the child. Now, this is her second child with ASAP Rocky, but they're not married or anything. So I, it's kind of, and she didn't announce she was pregnant. There was a lot of speculation. She confirmed later after the fact that she was, but it seemed kind of like that to me, Mm -hmm. like this space theme of like this, like landing 
and like Crowley and moon child because the moon child thing is also another one where it's like we don't want to know the the paternity of the children and lots of orgiastic type of uh mixed race babies and things like that that uh, the Crowley and cults were into so like yeah and if you don't know what a moon child is that's a baby that's conceived in a ritualistic way that's supposed to have magic powers yes right yeah, so I wonder if this was kind of, because they're saying she's the first person to perform pregnant at a Super Bowl halftime, and it's like, knowing what we know about her, if this wouldn't be like kind of a ceremonial induction for the child, you know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So a, a lot of this to me is also very anti-Theotokos with, you know, Madonna. Mm-hmm. Um, she's the an- anti-Mary yeah right and then rihanna being worshipped as a mother yep um especially when she's done you know snm was literally she had a single called snm yeah with britney yeah she's done lots of bondagey themed uh promiscuity themed kinds of things like black madonna kinds of things and now Mm -hmm. she's pregnant so we're gonna do this giant ceremony I write all about Black Madonna and Beyonce in my Hollywood Mind Control book. Yes. Nothing against yeah. Black women, but, you know, it's a it's an anti-Christian theme. Yes. So, okay, let's talk about Rihanna's beginning for a second. Yeah. Because she's a protege of Jay-Z, mm-hmm. who's huge in this uh, agenda. Yes. With Beyonce. Her, one of her early hits was Umbrella. Do you remember that? Under my umbrella. Yes. And in it, Jay-Z has a little rap, but he's a terrible artist. He's so bad. I've never, I like of all the people to put up as like the guy, and this has been since before I knew anything about this. I'm just like, he ain't nothing to look at number one and number two he's just a terrible rapper I feel like the mumble rap thing kind of came from him maybe because it's just it's really bad um so he has this rap where he calls himself rain man and to me the rain man I mean you could say I make it rain in the strip club because I'm rich and I'm a rain man but in Mesopotamia the rain man was ball the storm god oh right ball haydad was a god of thunder and lightning and rain and storm clouds and child sacrifice and so i feel like this is a demon huh all their favorite things yeah (laughs) so i feel like rain man is the demon who is taking rihanna under his umbrella right that could be i just saw a clip when i was doing research for this stream of her talking about the single umbrella and how it was like her big breakout because the first few songs she did she was still like a teenager and it was a very innocent thing and that single was like her breakthrough it was the first one that she really did that was like jay-z hova it was like it was very jay-z influence and it was very different from her island girl thing that she had before that yeah and she said she had listened to all these demos for all these different songs and she didn't like any of them and they weren't very good and when she heard this one she was just praying it would be good she was just hoping and hoping it would be good because she just hadn't found any songs she liked and it turned out to be this huge hit and she loved it and she was super happy with it. And so it was like a big deal to her, I guess. Mm-hmm. So this is another song that I'm talking about is the love song to Lucifer. And she's singing to him and, and looking for the devil's protection. And the album is called Good Girl Gone Bad. Yes. And this mm-hmm. is something they love. Like Katy they Perry love to do this. was a Christian artist before she sold her soul a devil mm-hmm. yeah and we've gone over miley cyrus and britney spears how they all had this like innocent disney kid nice girl image and they 
always go through this transition into, ooh, I'm a sexy vixen now. I'm a mm-hmm. naughty girl. I'm a bad naughty girl. <laughs> and yeah, they like literally named her album Good Girl Gone Bad. Yeah. It was like super over. And she said the haircut, do you remember how she had the long hair and then she changed it to the black, like very angled short haircut at yeah. this for this album? Yeah. She said the inspiration for the haircut was Charlize Theron's hair in Anne Flux. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And that movie had some stuff in it. Yeah. I think Jay did a good article on that. Yeah. On Aeon so. Flux a while ago. Mm-hmm. Um. So then she did that song Disturbia. And if you haven't seen that, at least look it up because then you know where Rihanna's coming from. This is her demon possession song. Like she's, Disturbia is where she lives now in her mind because she's allowed these demons to enter her. Yep. Right. I'm also thinking of a Beyonce song that I can't remember the title of, but like she levitates like the girl in Exorcist and there's a white dove above her and she uh what is it sweet dreams so it's like almost incubus level lyrics about consummating with the devil yeah that's another theme that goes way back i just did a stream with patrick where we were talking about late 1800s witches writing books on how to consummate with spirits and and things like that so it's a the stuff isn't new it goes way back and they always say like it's good and bad like it's pleasurable but it's also painful and that goes back to what madonna was talking about with her you know catholic snm and everything like that so uh this the lyric in the beyonce song is you can be a sweet dream or a beautiful nightmare oh yeah i do be an angel or a monster Mm -hmm. it just depends um yeah, so you got Disturbia, you've got that song s and with Britney, which is super gross. Mm-hmm. And then she had an album called Anti. Yes. Right? Yep. That was one of her biggest. And she said that that album was like a uh, spiritual, like she was in a really conflicted place because she's another person that says she's Christian vaguely, right? Rihanna she- does? Rihanna does. I found a few articles where she says, oh, I was raised Christian and I still believe in God, but in a different way. So it's like gives the reader the impression that she's still like some kind of vaguely Christian. But she said that she was really conflicted with God during the making of anti. Hmm. So I'm not I'm not exactly sure what to take from that, but there was weird imagery that went with that album too. Oh yeah, the cover is a child with a crown covering its eyes. Mm-hmm. And this made me think of Horus, crown and conquering child, god yep. of, of war. Uh, I've seen pictures of Drake in concert and he has Rihanna flashing on a screen with 666. Mm-hmm. And they dated for a while. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, is anti, like, anti-Christ? Anti, I don't know. Um, am I reaching? I don't think so. I don't think so. And, like, some of the songs from the album were very bizarre um, and weird. And I remember there was a photo shoot she did during that album also where she was, like, very cross-dressing where she had like a men's suit and tie and like they made her eyebrows really thick and bushy and made her look like very masculine Mm -hmm. and I remember seeing that at the time and being like that's kind of a weird choice for somebody who is like always trying to be sexy and attractive to men it's kind of weird but they do that stuff a lot it's all a lot of cross-dressing stuff all the time with these people so oh the crown child is also like Kabbalistic represent the the kether the crown okay and then um Isaac Weishaupt did a really good uh like 20 minute video on Rockfin about the video diary of anti it's like an eight-part series that's kind of obscure like you have to have um some sort of samsung subscription or something he goes over it so look up isaac weishap on rockfin and these vignettes like go from her childhood 
to her. It's basically the story or the alchemical process of her joining the dark side. That so, makes sense. yeah, if you're interested in that, it's very good. Um, geez, do you have anything else about the Super Bowl? I there was that guy, that football player that had a collapse, and then he showed up again with the jacket that had a blasphemous SpongeBob crucified. I that's something that was so weird that I didn't know what the heck to make of it. I just stood there, I just sat there staring at it on my phone for like 10 minutes, just being like, Yeah, it was super weird. And there's been a ton of athletes, a lot of football players. I I don't follow sports ball, you guys, so please forgive me, but there was one really high profile football player, I believe, who people were speculating whether or not he was dead and replaced with a body double for a while. <laughs> okay. um, I don't remember his name, but it was somebody who's popular and people were speculating as to like what happened to him. Cause he collapsed on the field, was taken off on a stretcher and not seen for days. And then suddenly was just like back in public, like, Oh, hi, I'm fine. But he didn't look the same is what people were saying. Now I don't know the guy. So like, I couldn't tell you, but people who followed him were like that is not the same guy mm -hmm. um and we've had a lot of this a lot of this whole like oh everyone's always dropped dead from heart attacks suddenly at a young age when they're healthy athletes you just didn't hear about it until now this is something they love to do where some crazy phenomenon will start and they'll be like oh it's always been like that you're just hearing about it more now like oh everyone's always been t-r-a-n-z Everyone's always been. It's just that now you're hearing about it. Oh, everybody's always been G A Y. Yeah. Everybody's always been fake and gray. It's just that now everyone's comfortable. So you're seeing more of it. It's like, no, that's another giant gaslighting thing where they tell us, like, oh no, it's it's just like 1984. It's like we've always been at war with East Asia. No, no, I'm 43. And no, this was not normal for athletes to just be dropping dead left and right. And um for the Super Bowl to be filled with like biohazmat suits and all this other weird imagery. And then the other thing that we didn't mention is that in the live broadcast, this was not shown, but other people who had different angles of video or people who were recording on their cell phones at the end of her performance, Rihanna did one of these mm -hmm. and it's that video is all over the internet now and everybody has seen it. Um, but yeah, like from the, everything from the color scheme to, I noticed also like her hair, there's been this thing, it could just be a trend, but Madonna had it. Remember Madonna had the braided pan mm -hmm. braids, like the goat horn braids. Mm -hmm. Rihanna had the slicked back hairdo with the two little pieces down and the braids in this really long ponytail. I've seen that making the rounds among the usual suspects so I don't know if there's some kind of trend or symbolism with the because braids are like ropes so I don't know if there's something there or not but she again not a very glamorous not a very not like what you would expect from Rihanna except for that they were trying to make some kind of symbolic statement with these giant puffy outfits and but still, there still had to be some of the bending over and shaking your butt and the men thrusting and this kind of thing. And um, they gave a little shout out to her makeup brand where she put the powder on her face. But yeah. there was with the alien stuff, I felt like it was definitely an alien reference with the platforms that would constantly like raise and lower. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, things being shot down and then the train crashes and the coof stuff. And then everybody's looking like biohazard suits. And I felt again, like it was the same people who put together the Grammys, put together the Super Bowl halftime show. I should yes. look and see if the producers or designers were like on the same team or what, because it seemed very. Yeah. Their, their themes are always on trend with each other every mm -hmm. year. Um, and yeah, going right back to the triangle of manifestation that she did. Now people are gonna be like, this is Jay-Z's Roka wear, Hova diamond, blah, blah, blah. But literally, if you go to the uh, ritual books of Alistair Crowley, they have pictures of one of the stances and one of the rituals and he's doing this. It's some kind mm -hmm. of, I forget exactly what, because I don't try to remember these things too much. <laughs> 
um it's in my book but it's a fire sign or something and in kabbalah it's called the triangle of manifestation you're supposed to put the moon in the middle of your triangle and then transfer some stupid moon power into some amulet or something retarded like that mm. so this is a magical thing that came about way 100 years before jay-z was even a thing yeah right yeah and you can like if you just google alistair crowley and then click on images you'll see tons of images of him doing that of him wearing like triangle hats of people doing it over the one eye it's just something you see all the time it's and in sam smith in, in his promotional um photo shoots he was doing one eye stuff yeah mm-hmm. right. they all they all do that i mean pictures of celebrities doing the cover one eye is like a dime a dozen you can find more pictures of them doing it than you can find of pictures of them not doing it there was Um, and Beyonce did it in her Super Bowl halftime performance she very famously gave threw up that sign and that performance will go down as one of the most like overtly satanic symbolic performances of all time Oh yeah, where they were um, posting pictures of her like possessed and stuff and with ugly yeah. faces. Um, like in the ugly faces and everything. <laughs> yeah. If you uh, want all of the one eye symbolism that you could ever want, there was this like five hour long documentary by this uh, Australian American Idol winner or something, Altian Childs. He has every single picture celebrity doing the one eye thing you could ever want so um there you have it it's yeah same old same old and i just don't know how more much more we should even cover this stuff because like i don't know what more to tell y'all yeah i think that when we talk about the symbolism it helps people buy into the idea that this is not like silly stuff. This isn't meaningless. When you do take a look behind the scenes at, okay, this woman is worth $1.7 billion. And then let's find out what she's doing with that money and who is helping control that money and where is it going and stuff like that. It's like, it makes it more real for people to see that like, both Madonna and Rihanna and probably a lot of these other celebrities foundations are all taking these massive amounts of money and funneling them through the same entities with the same goals and the same objectives that line up with the symbolism that we've just talked about. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not like an abstract and like, Oh, who cares if she makes the sign? What is that really doing? Well, behind the scenes, there's multiple millions of dollars billions over the course of a few years going to things that are very suspicious and that are like overtly also people and entities that have satanic agendas as well so I mean to me that's like okay kind of case closed because it all fits together if, if I had looked into her background, if I had looked into her organization and found like, oh, okay, she's just, um, you know, buying glasses for poor children in, you know, uh, Mongolia or somewhere, but it's always the same places. It's always the same things. It's always the same thing over and over and over and over. And it's like, how many billions of dollars are you guys going to put into Malawi before we start asking questions when you're all part of the same organizations you're all doing the same symbolism you're all involved in the same shenanigans that we see year after year after year Mm -hmm. so to me it's like I know it doesn't prove anything but it certainly should make you think it's more than just like oh these are silly people who just want to like make you think they're satanists and who really cares well, they're having a real effect on the world. This woman is worth $1.7 billion. Yeah. And not to mention the whole professional sports is a its own, you know, you could do your own show about for sure stadiums and human TRAFF. And mm-hmm. these big games are perfect opportunities for that kind of activity. Um, the underground tunnels underneath these things, how they are all planned out 
um, who's going to win, who's going to lose, who's going to get injured, who's not. Like, it's all fake as pro wrestling. Yeah. Right? That's true. And a lot of these players are also under the monarch mind control like the celebrities are. And, you know, if I just can say one thing closing up, like, I don't hate these people. We pray for their souls. Mm -hmm. Right? I don't hate Rihanna or Britney or even Madonna. We hope that they repent and get out of their prison and their abusive relationship with the devil right? yeah and actually rihanna's backstory of how she was raised is super similar to britney and a lot of the other people that we've covered where she was like a very poor girl in barbados who really liked singing and dancing and her parents had like a really rocky abusive relationship she was very poor and you know, uh, record company executives magically find her, you know, and pluck mm. her from obscurity and groom her for this. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it's not like she wasn't, she was almost kind of a victim of it in the same way that Brittany and a lot of these people yeah. were, where it's like, they think when they get into this, that they're going to be a singing, dancing star, who's going to entertain everybody and make everybody love their music and their dancing and then it becomes this right yeah and, and they're groomed from a very young impressionable age yes and rihanna definitely was i think when they discovered her she was like 16 same as britney same age yeah and there was scandals about maybe jay-z and rihanna having a relation <laughs> rihanna rihanna having a relationship that when she was underage and that's why he had to put her together with chris brown this is just mm -hmm. some crazy story I heard today that Rihanna got the H-E-R-P-E-S from Jay-Z and gave it to Chris Brown. And that's what led to the whole fight and her getting a black eye and all that. So okay. that's just gossip. Right. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Rachel, I don't know either, but there's also a little tidbit that I found on her where when she was brought to the United States to audition for Jay-Z's label, um, she, the guy who discovered her when he took her from the Caribbean, moved her into his house with him and his wife mm -hmm. for a, like a year or something. Mm -hmm. So yeah, very groomy, very suspect in a way. Again, this is not, this is a girl who was like on the streets trying to sell like t-shirts or whatever with her dad to get enough money for food and then she's plucked from obscurity gets in with these like mega wealthy billionaire like ultra powerful people and you can just kind of it's a, another tale that's as old as time you can kind of see what happens so yeah it's not it's that like we dark hate them Cinderella it's, story oh, right yeah yeah and I think that these people can be mind controlled and charmed and all that stuff just as much as anybody else so um I don't think she she may not be somebody that has as much agency as you would think either she might we don't know yet it might come out down the road that Lord only knows what was going on and the thing with the babies I just I feel like in the future we're gonna find out something because they don't tell you like she won't say what the baby's names are or anything like that and you don't really see a lot it's very secretive. So it's, again, it's just speculation. We're just going off of what we can get out of media reports and interviews and things like that. But yeah, I don't know. It's all very, <laughs> it's just amazing how time after time when we go, oh, let's look into this. And it turns out to be the same things behind it every time. Yeah. So. Well, Rachel has her own YouTube channel now. I do. What is it called and where can we find it? And what's it all about? It's just called Rachel Wilson. So okay. if you just search Rachel Wilson, I, I tend to come up, I come up pretty, pretty well um, on YouTube right now. And it's kind of just me doing all the stuff that I do. So I do some deep dives about things like this, the stuff that I research and write about. In addition to that, I do a lot of talking about homeschool, which is something that people ask me about all the time because people want to get into it. But there's stigma around it. They have worries. They have fears. They have concerns. They have questions. Maybe sometimes one parent is more on board than the other, or maybe both parents are on board, but their parents are like, 
not, you know what I mean? You get a lot of um, kind of pushback from friends and family. So I talk, I'm going to do a lot about homeschooling. And then I started a series with Patrick from Church of the Eternal Logos, my buddy, my pal, my friend who we do a lot of streams together, um, where we're talking about the patriarchy and masculinity and, you know, the relations between the sexes and marriage and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, that's basically what it is. It's just like all the Rachel Wilson stuff in one place finally, because everybody has been really pestering me to do it. And I just thought I should do it. So yeah, I'm doing it. <laughs> well, you're the um, new rising star in our circle. And I'm excited to see what you have. You're my favorite girl. Um, oh, you're my I'm favorite girl. girl. Thanks. And I'm so glad you came on tonight. And I guess that is all. We will see you next time on out of this world. Oh, we decided in my chat last week that you're all called cadets. Cadets. <laughs> so Jay has his Chad nerds. Yes. And the show's called Out of This World, and they said they want to be called cadets. So good night, cadets, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>